now. Okay. I'm going to ask, who would like to do that? Okay, Grace is going to lead us in a word of prayer. Let's humble ourselves. Father Lord, we thank you for everything that you have done for us. May your name be glorified because if it wasn't because of your love, we wouldn't exist here, Father. So we pray and we thank you for everything that you have done for us. May you lead us during this training, Father. And may your name be glorified in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amina. Uh, well, good afternoon, Uganda. Uh, my name is Patty Houston Holm, and I am coming in from uh, Canal, Winchester, Ohio, in the United States. And uh, I'm going to introduce our presenter today, our main presenter. Uh, first of all, I'd like for everyone else to mute your microphones, except for me and Larry. And a uh, reminder that if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and uh, we'll be addressing those uh, later. And you can also ask them uh, outside the chat box. So uh, as part of the Uganda Christian University and Uganda Partners e-learning lab, uh, we are having monthly presenters for students. And the purpose of these presentations is to take the textbook learning you have and uh, apply it into the real world. So today, our main presenter is a commercial photographer. I realize many of you uh, will not end up being full-time photographers, uh, but you will apply this skill set probably in just about any career that you have in journalism and communications. So I'm going to welcome Larry Hamill, who is a highly esteemed uh, uh, commercial photographer from the state of Ohio, and uh, he's going to share with you some visuals and some tips that you might be able to use. So I'm going to mute my microphone now and turn it over to Larry. Okay, hopefully this um, transitions. Okay, yeah, glad that you're all here. I'm happy to share these images with you. And uh, a lot of times when I shoot on assignment, I never know what I'm going to be confronted with until I get to the location. So the first thing I'm going to show is a, a rescue that was staged on a river, the Muskingum River in Eastern Ohio. And I, I didn't know until I got to the site that there'd be 10 emergency vehicles there, two helicopters and about 50 people that on the spur of the moment, I had to direct and stage this accident. So they had a ski jet and a boat in the river as if they collide. And I, I told them, I thought, well, it have be a better image if somehow we could slide the jet ski up on the boat so it looked like it, which actually happens sometimes so what we'll see here is a scene that i set up the boat and the ski jet and i had their other vehicle spin around as fast as it could in the background to create the impact to a little bit more, more dynamic so we go from there to another scene which I shot aerially to get it but I'm seeing this and it just doesn't quite have the impact because this is for the calendar which is a major um, tool for them to make their clients aware of what they do. Ended up getting on another boat much closer with a wide angle lens and used the flash fill so there wasn't shadows or anything and this is the image that they ended up using on the uh, cover of their calendar then in another month. But I thought, well, since I was there, why don't I call in one of the helicopters and have them hover in the background? So you never know what's gonna happen. So I had the helicopter hovering there, but then I should have known this from previous experience. There's a lot of prop wash when they get closer. So when it came in closer, we all got drenched from the water that it was kicking up, but at least we'd already got the shot that we needed. So that made it kind of, uh, Interesting. So we go from there to this is the finishing up, but you can see some of the, hel the two helicopters in the background, a couple of these, but it is like a lot of pressure when you get there and you don't know exactly 
what you're going to be dealing with. But it all worked out fine in this situation. Here's another situation where I've never been to this location before. It was in the wintertime for Lucent Technologies, and they wanted to do a group shot of all team. So I'm confronted with this room, which is totally dark, but I wanted to show you how I set it up with portable strobe lights. These are Dynalite strobe lights, and you see to the left how dark it is in there. And if I hadn't used these lights, we would never see the uh, interior properly. So what I did was I had the people get together there and use those lights cropped in and did this group portrait from this angle here and then went a lower angle so they'd have another option to see. But, you know, like I said, these people would, everybody be in shadow if I hadn't put these four strobes and lit the scene. Then we go from there to an annual report I shot. This is for a large research corporation. And, was, and this is a, a, an employee and his wife help um, disadvantaged kids and they their home, but they did not have any furnishing in this home. So which, I, which they told me ahead of time. And I thought, oh, that's gonna be a problem. So I went out and bought this kind of collapsible sphere and bought them some interesting uh, toys to play with in the foreground. So by not having anything in the back, I created this, this concept where they can be playing with these to still have it work. So when you have nothing to deal with, anticipate and see what kind of shot you can get. And sometimes you just never know what you're gonna run with. This is inside a research lab. And this is a really unusual um, situation where they electrify these plants. And somehow by doing so, they can distribute different types of nutrients or insect deterrents underneath the leaves so they wouldn't get washed off. But then again, I'm in this lab and I knew I had to bring a backdrop. So I brought a blue backdrop and I didn't know it was going to be lit then, by ultraviolet lights. So what I did, I was, did a time exposure and you can see the stream of image of the liquid coming in and then here is the residue underneath the leaves. So it was a very effective system, but I'm not sure how they utilized it in the real world. But um, we go from there to another device they made, which is a spraying of a mesh that would help with a wound on site. So it helps seal the skin. And you, needed, you can see it being distributed there, but I had the um, scientists hold this, this circular device so you can see how it bonds with the skin and the device. So th this is a case where I use a ring flash, which is a light unit that goes on the front of the camera a lot of times, it's so you can do macro shots. But what I did was disengage it and held it off to the left side and illuminated it with that. So you never know when that comes in handy. This is for another publication where these women created this product but when I first got to their place, they, all they had was a bunch of boxes in their basement. So I thought, okay, well, let's rearrange these, bring the products out. And then again, I used strobe lights to light the basement, but it wouldn't have worked if I hadn't put a strobe behind them with a slight bluish gel to complement the pink hues that they had with their product. If I didn't have that light in the background, I don't think it'd be as a successful shot. But that all worked out for the publication. This is uh, for a, a bank that wanted to paint your financial future. That was their concept. So I get there again and rented a studio space where a friend had a uh, glass brick wall. And these were models of posts. So I put strobe lights with soft boxes behind the wall. Like that. After the models had left, I cleared the table put a canvas down and had the paintbrush on the table using the same light source. So it'd be convincing. And then in Photoshop, I blended the two images. And then they also had text and things, but they're making a future by using their services. This is for the thumb, our Columbus Public Libraries. And uh, this is for their annual report. So, this is one of the rare times I use shots that aren't my own. These are from NASA, the different planets and things. So what I did was had these kids pose. And I think the, the critical element to making this successful was if you see the book there, I hid a portable strobe that's battery powered in the book. So it illuminated, because otherwise 
you would get light sources and shadows and things. So this eliminated the shadows and gave more of the feeling of all these things coming from the book. So, and I did that the rest in Photoshop where I pasted it together and added the streams that are flowing out of the book. But that was used on the cover of their annual report. And then another client wanted to be in the future and looking at different things in a unique way. So what I did was I photographed one of the people in the organization there, cut the figure out and then placed them in a 3D program that I use. And I rendered the program there and they wanted to show it both that way and then a horizontal panoramic view. So I also used the same figure. You can see he's reflected and he's looking at this more in a panoramic way. So this is like applying painterly techniques with different software to convey an idea that the client wants to share. There to a college in Northeastern Ohio, actually David Bowie's son went to this college, it's called Wooster College. Situation where I had the camera on the tripod and I did two exposures. The first exposure was a second and a half for the computer monitor because I had turned off all the lights. And the second exposure was a quick pop with the stroke side to define professor and the student in the shot. So the, the, I just had the camera on the tripod, kept the shutter open then popped the strobe because if I did it with conventional lighting, it wouldn't have the dynamic um, three-dimensional quality that it has this way. It'd be a flatter image and not quite as interesting. Also, they had a very small room where another professor is studying uh, the rings and growth of trees throughout the world. Actually, you can see the samples on the other side. So this is a case where I'm, I'm starting to lose my voice. So I'm going to have some tea here. But this small room, so what I did was I put two lights on either side and then put one in the back room. And I used a 15 millimeter full frame fisheye to be able to capture the scene there. So sometimes you got to make sure that you've got the right lens to make that happen. This is at Columbus State, actually the the third largest university in the state of Ohio, after Ohio State and I believe Cincinnati. And this is on a creative writing. And this is another case that if I had done a static shot, it wouldn't have the same impact as using a flash and then a slower shutter speed to make the background kind of blue and it put the attention on the subjects there as opposed to uh, you know, the blinds in the background. But um, there's all kinds of situations. You never know what you're going to be confronted with. And this is a walkway that goes, and you can see the CS on the right. That's for Columbus State. And I had a, a student walk through there and tried to get her at the right moment. And uh, it's kind of a cool bridge. It's got all these little sculptures you can see on the left that are intertwined throughout the um, geometric setting there. And then this is a pipeline analysis um, at the site uh, west of Columbus. And this is getting there during the day and just lighting it a little bit, but anticipating shooting at dusk. So in this situation, I wanted to make sure I got a few shots in case the weather changed or anything like that. So this is a woman testing the different viability of this pipe system. And um, so what happened was as it got later, I used what's called a graduated filter that had a magenta cast to it. And I used that on the in part neutral density. And I used that on the sky, because if I didn't, the sky would be bright white and overpower everything. So this added a bit of color and also muted the sky. And in a way, I have to think in terms of how a client might want to use type. Like they might have a headline in that open space. So I didn't want that distracting or anything. So a big part of shooting, whether it be photo, photojournalistic or commercially, is to cropping. Because you want to think, where can somebody possibly use type? What makes an interesting composition? What angle do you want to get? So here, as you see, it's getting darker. And I thought, well, if, be much more interesting if I literally got underneath this pipe, laid on the ground and shot. And this is the one they ended up using. But you can see I had a couple strobes in the background where I had a magenta gel on that. 
to, to make it more interesting. So <clears throat> this is uh, a shot that was one possibility. I also wanted to give them another option. So I was up on a lift too. And I used uh, that vantage point to give them a totally different look. So happy with that. This is a um, manufacturer of different plastics. And um, it was in a large factory. The background was very busy with a lot of things going on. So I wanted to minimize the background. So in this case, kind of the opposite of university shot with a computer monitor, I used a faster shutter speed and used my lights with a very slight gel of yellow that you see just to add a little interest, but had no light available light coming from the background. So it emphasized the person. Is, is Larry frozen for everybody else or just for me? He's frozen for me as well. Okay. Larry, if you can hear us, you're, uh, your screen is frozen. And I think we may have lost him. <laughs> I think we lost Larry. Let's see if he comes back in. In the meantime, I want to mention to all of you, um, if you can hear me, do a thumbs up. Or no, you don't want to do a thumbs up in Uganda. Uh, raise your hand if you can hear me. OK, thank you. Um, so Larry's talking about a lot of uh, technical things. and. Um, to the background. So, oh, great. You are back, Larry. We, we lost oh, you for okay. a while. Can you put your shared screen back up? Uh, I'm not sure how I am. I we okay. lost you for about uh, three minutes. And then now you just you're back. OK, can you see the image now? No, I have to do. You maybe have to stop shared screen and then go back into shared screen again. Oh, okay. Oh, that's too bad. So I just left, huh? Well, the last image you saw, the pipeline or the? Yeah, it was the pipeline. Okay. Um, gosh, I'm trying so, to, so I go click on the Zoom. Okay. And then I go share screen. Yeah. And then go back to here. I hit share. Okay, so is that it? Yep, and you, you want to put it on. You want to put it on full shared screen instead of. Um, let's see. Go to your PowerPoint and make it full screen. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not seeing. It probably is at the bottom, I believe. It, can you see yeah, it now? There you go. Yep, it's good. Oh, okay. So good. we go. Uh, let's see. I'll go back to the tour. Okay. So and I don't know how you. Can you get rid of that little thing that says this keynote presentation may look different? Can you click on the button on that? Let's see. Um, I have to escape again. Oh, that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, got it. Then you okay. got to go back to full screen. Yeah. Okay. So you guys didn't see this image then? We did see that one. Yep. Okay. 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 Now we go from there to the color. So it must have been just a glitch, this one. We did not see that one, yeah. Okay, that's a big turbine in West Virginia that uh, was shut down for maintenance. And um, what I did was, uh, normally you can never get the shot because it's always operational. They have several of these turbines that are in use and this one was shut down for maintenance. So I lit the foreground and then Instead of going totally back in the back, black in the background where the other gentleman is, I used um, a warming gel because these things generate a ton of heat when they're spinning. 
And this is a laboratory situation where I try to minimize the color, but emphasize the, uh, the equipment they're working on different genetic um, projects. And I just tried to emphasize um, the, the new technology that they're using in this case. Okay, and this is a Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. This is a chamber that they devised where they sh shoot solid carbon dioxide on different jet engine parts to clean them. So they don't have the drop, you know, a bad effect that something like sand or some other element might hurt the product. This just cleans it. But um, this is another situation where if I use just a straight flash, it'd all be flattened and not look as dynamic. So I use several different light sources to uh, create that effect. This is at Oak Ridge National Labs. That's where the first fusion happened in the, on the planet. And this is, at the time was one of the fastest computers on the planet. And so I went there to photograph that. I've been there in several locations uh, over the years. Okay, these are some of the scientists dealing with welding technology. And what I did was I did a conventional shot and that's one of the projects they were working with. So. They, they, fortunately, this gave me total freedom how to shoot this. I thought, okay, I could do it this way. I could also do a frame where they're in the center of one of the, the, the elements they work with. And then I put a different spark in the background. But also I thought, well, what the heck? Why not, hey, you guys, do you mind just sitting on the chairs like this? And well, trust me, I'm gonna integrate you with one of, the, one of your projects. So I had previously had a shot that they provided me of uh, the structures and how they analyze. And the main thing is analyzing to know when a weld will fail. So that's really as critical as um, anything to do with that. So what I did was I took this shot and added them to their graphic that I'd previously seen. And that's the shot that they ended up using. And the, another part of their team, the head guy, used to work with this firm that was a mile away from the research firm he's at now. So I went to the location and photographed this welding device and kept the shutter open to get the sparks and marked where I had the lights because he was not on good terms with the people there. So I had to set up the same lighting scenario in a basement, light him the same way, and then strip him in with this welding unit that was a mile away. So sometimes you have to deal with politics in a way too. Now, I don't know if anybody knows what this is by looking at it. It's kind of um, hard to tell, but it's actually at the time a high tech solar panel. And this is at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. And these are different technologies that they were working on there. Um, this is a special kind of solar panel. And this is one way that you can see the environment that it's in. This is shot with a relatively normal lens, a little bit wide. And I thought, well, another way to make this more. In, to make it interesting would be to use a long lens and play with depth of field. So this shows more of the units, but it also shows the attention to detail that the scientists are putting in. Here's another unit where one of the scientists is reflected in the glass panels that are used through solar energy and then into this unit on the right here. So, and this is uh, just the prototypes that they're working on. Another thing that they're working on were wind turbines. So you see the turbine over there with the little fencing above it. I'm on a similar turbine standing in the fencing with the clients on the left and the scientists on the right. So to give this a sense of scale, what I did was I did a cars parked there. And what we did is they got a tiny little elevator inside there where one person at a time goes up to the top, but they analyze the different blades and things like that. So we go from there to the fire academy on the east side of Columbus. This is part of Columbus State's training. So if somebody wants to be a firefighter, you do that. So I'm wearing the same gear that they're wearing when I'm doing a shot. Naturally, it was scheduled on a day when it was 95 degrees and very humid. And the humidity was really high. So put that with the fire, it was pretty intense. It really made me appreciate what firefighters have to go through. So we're there and by the time 
I spent 45 minutes shooting this. My, my boots were literally filled with a couple inches of sweat. It was just so intense. But so we're here and then afterwards I get a photo of one of the students uh, leaving the environment that they were in. And then they take off their, their hat and she's relieved of, I left that. And then this is a group afterwards. You can see the, the gentleman in the background wasn't having that much fun there, but they were glad that they had that experience on this very hot day. So this is at Ohio State in the agricultural school. And this is a scientist working with different cattle there. This is up near the university airport. And I used the flash to fill in because it was an overcast day and it wasn't quite as interesting without the flash. You can see a plane in the background uh, leaving the airport above the woman's head there. But, uh, oh, and this is a historic farm, not too far from where Patty was, called Slate Run Historic Farm. And I like going there, but you never know what day is gonna happen. And it's not really scheduled, but they, the, this is a farm and it operates the way it did in the 1890s. And I was just fortunate to be there this day when they're literally plowing the fields. So it was kind of uh, a shot for the fun of it. Now this one was more of a challenge. This is both a client and a friend and his grandparents owned this store in Southern Ohio. And this is a picture that he had. And he said, well, you use Photoshop all the time and which I do, I, I was fortunate to have a beta copy 31 years ago, just a, a CD disc and put it in my computer. And it was called Barney Scan Pro. It wasn't even called Photoshop. So I learned from that point on that what I did was it was retouch it and it looks totally different. So it was, it was a challenge to do this, but it was an interesting challenge. So you can see the before and the after. So Photoshop's a pretty powerful tool. It's a good thing to know for photojournalism. This is at Warner Robins Air Force Base in Georgia. This is a giant Starlifter aircraft. So you can see the scale. This is like five stories up the, the top of the tail fin there. And this research company called Battelle, they're actually the largest nonprofit research company in the world. They developed the Xerox machine. That's what really got them off. If you look at the universal pricing code on products, they're instrumental in that. They're instrumental in creating the CD, the compact disc. They're also instrumental in creating a spray that helps protect the aircraft. So you can see how high it is. But the only time we could access the plane inside the hangar, since they're working 24 hours a day, was at three in the morning, they had an opening. So we had to go up and rig all the lights I had in the system with me. And what I did was I rigged the lights, you can see how high up it is, and then backlit the spray to make it pop. Because if I didn't backlight it, you probably wouldn't see the spray. But this gives it a sense of scale. And this was what they used on the cover to show off. And, and this is again, using composition and leaving space above so they can run type across there to say what they're doing. And also leaving on the bottom right some space for copy too. So that was a little tricky assignment. Then later the next day we went there and they're working on fighter jets. And again, I tried to use a minimal use of gels, but to convey the idea that there's a lot of heat generated in these units. So I just used a little bit of yellow in there while these gentlemen were working on the engines. Okay, then we go from there to one where, um, it's a shot of Versailles. This is just for the fun of it. I photographed the humming bird in Nevada, and then I stripped that in with a mirrored shot I did at Versailles in France. And this is like a little transition. So this is kind of a fun thing in Columbus, Ohio. There's a large insurance agency that had a, like a large area next to where their main building was. And they, the only problem was there was a big house sitting there and they wanted to create a park. So a friend of mine said, well, I'll buy the house. How much do you want for it? Oh, a dollar, because they wanted to get rid of it but it cost her a fortune to have it moved. So this is Central Ohio that called High Street. And this, they're moving this house down the street. And I thought, my friend, her name is Julie. I said, well, why don't you pose like you're pulling it down the street and then I'll strip in a rope. So there she is, pulling, like she's pulling the house. But what they had to do was move all the power lines. So they had all these people there so the house wouldn't hit the power lines. 
Well, unfortunately, at one point, they didn't pull it up high enough. I don't have a shot of that happening, but the attic caught on fire. And it was a big problem because they didn't know what address to tell the fire department to come to. <laughs> it was a house in the middle of High Street. I mean, they figured it out and they put out the fire. But then they had a, a neighbor here who's helping to push it too. So that was just for the fun of it. But it was tricky to see it make a turn. They had all these wheels there on the bottom. And then here's a case where you try to be prepared for a shot. You bring all this equipment. This is a, a auto manufacturer in Chicago, Illinois, where they made the, the New Yorker car, oddly enough. So this was years ago, and this was pre-digital. So brought all these lights there, and this is a special device meant to bake the paint just right on the cars. So um, they said, whatever you do, don't have a flash go off. I had, well, I've got all these strokes. Well, if a flash goes off, it, it thinks it's a fire and it shuts down the system for an hour and you'll have to buy 30 New Yorker cars. And I'm going, well, I didn't want one New Yorker car, much less 30 New Yorker cars. So <laughs> they were just kind of threatening me to make sure I didn't use my flash. So what I had to do, since it was using film, I had 400 ectochrome that I pushed two stops to um, 1600 and handheld this shot. So I'm inside the unit while these things are moving, getting the shots with available light. But I tried to uh, you know, make an interesting composition. So sometimes you get on a location and you never know what you're gonna be confronted with. But you kind of have to anticipate too. This is on an assignment for a, a uh, woman that was in the WNBA and she had a nice collection of sunglasses. So. I just thought, oh, that'd be cool as an element to go in the story. And they liked that shot and published that as part of the story. Now, this is a good friend of mine who is uh, a goldsmith. He's been doing this um, since his early 20s. This is Lapis Lazula. And he does all these wonderful pieces. So you saw those strobe lights I did for the portraits. I also use the same strobes, like three of them with special grid spots on them to direct the light to make it more dynamic. So you can see the shadows that are cast. That's a Yavuravite on the bottom left That's uh, that he got from Russia and other elements where he makes these necklaces. But this is using the same lights, but in a specific way where you limit the light and direct it to do this macro photography. And here's another case where I used like three lights to photograph the sapphire, but had it at an angle so it looks like it's floating above the background. But it's critical to him that you get all the facets that they show up well in the diamonds that he put in there. So this is like ob obviously operating on a macro scale compared to a big turbine. And then we cut out different, we go out in the alley and harvest some leaves there and then arrange them in this manner. And then I would light this with the strobes and uh, make sure that every product, uh, every ring is in focus in this unusual environment. This was promoting a new shopping center called Polaris, northern part of our city. And this is just showing people having a good time in the restaurants. And I kind of popped the strobe and then zoomed the camera out to get the blur. So I'm using both the strobe and available light to create this effect where people are having fun. And this at the time was the state of the art um, technology for uh, computer circuitry. And to set it off, I bought some fiber optics and I wanted them illuminated. So I used one of those strobes I showed earlier and gathered the fiber optics and had it pop. So you can see the light transmitted through the, the optics to set off the special wafer that they designed. This is at the Ohio State University where they treat uh, large animals and, and small animals in the vet school. So this is trying to, instead of just using a direct shot or, you know, available light, I, I modeled the light with uh, different effects. Here's another student that's um, a jet mechanic, but I tried to make a triangular composition. So one thing I'll tell you is like when I was in high school and I'd have study hall, I spent most of my time sitting looking at books of paintings. They didn't have so many on photography but looking at the composition and how did the artists align things? What kind of geometrics did they use? What made it more interesting? What drew your eye in? What made it 
dramatic. And what I'd suggest is that if you go online and look up good photographers or even old paintings from the Renaissance, or Asian paintings where in Japan, sometimes the most important thing in a painting is, is what's not there. So that's a very a different way of looking at things, but important because uh, sometimes it is the, the most important thing is what's not there. Here's a gentleman in, fr in front of a famous restaurant that he ran, but naturally it was overcast and getting ready to rain. So I cut in and stripped in a sunset that I shot in another location, but they like that. Here's a track coach and one of his athletes, but I tried to use a limited depth of field. This is just with available light. And I had an assistant off the side with a reflector to bounce some light back in, but I wanted to minimize the focus. So just emphasize that. Here's a case of um, a graduate from a university and a law firm, and they had a nice um, walkway. So I had her walk by and um, again, use lights to kind of freeze her, but have a kind of a more of a dynamic look than her sitting at a desk or something. A friend of mine developed this self-spotting weight equipment that this was years ago. So I photographed this, this athlete in three different positions out and then pasted her together so you could see the three different sections or possibilities lifting these weights. And he also had another unit. So I shot that with a a male athlete in the different positions and then put them in this 3D software. So you can see the reflection on the water underneath, but they, and I use space so they could use that for their brochure. And then we go from there to another, this is 25 years ago or so. So this is state-of-the-art technology and research they were doing at the time. So you could uh, see muscle, soft tissue, which was tricky to, to record back then. And you can see the gentleman's hand in the water and you see the, his thumb being shown on the screen. It's another case where I, it was totally dark and I had to keep the shutter on the camera on the tripod, shutter open for the screen and pop the strobes to get them in there. Okay, this is for MedFlight of Ohio. This is the BK Hill that they used to use, the big poster. So what you see in the background is an outline of the state of Ohio going from the right, from really rural to suburban to urban. So I service all those areas. And then I photographed the helicopter approaching from several different angles. They also wanted to show in another poster that they also offered fixed wing and then an MICU mobile intensive care units. And they wanted those all in a shot with this odd basket building. So this basket building actually exists in Newark, Ohio. And that was a sponsor of them. So what I did was I started with a sunset I'd shot someplace else as the background. I used the MICU as the, the prominent element in the foreground. Then I posted the uh, helicopter and I flopped it because obviously if it was reflected that would read backwards and wouldn't have the impact. So, and then I have a safe distance for the fixed wing to fly by, but you can look it up on the web, the Longenberger basket. They used to hand make these baskets and that was their corporate headquarters, which is now empty, but it's a big basket. And since we have winters here that can get really cold, ice could form on those handles up there and crash through the big glass atrium uh, ceiling that they had. So they had to heat the handles and the glass ice would form on those. Here's another case where I was on a lift shooting down on the uh, MICU and then brought these other elements together. But this is for a cover of another year for their calendar. And also this is another case in rural Ohio where I started with the MICU shot and then tried to strip it in compositionally to draw your eye from the background with the fixed blink, the helicopter, the MICU. So this is thinking of composition and Here's another of our city where there's a magazine showing off different elements of Columbus, Ohio. And I just slipped in some fun things there. So that was a collage. Here's another collage of our city where um, you can see um, Script Ohio, which is uh, a kind of a famous formation for uh, the Ohio State Band on the right. And then uh, the Columbus Zoo's um, emphasized Topiary Park, various other things. So this was used as a large mural. 
but these are just different elements. And then, you know, you know, there's Elvis posing, but it's a, it was somebody that was just, um, you know, dressed up as Elvis. Then I modified him in Photoshop. And it's my friend Arnett Howard is a great local musician. And I was just playing around with some different filters. And Arnett's great. He's played so many times in Columbus, but I was just trying different techniques with software to show how I could look in a different way. And we go from there to promoting Oktoberfest, a uh, weekend festival. And this is like ancient software that I use on an old computer. But the thing is, I kept the old computer. So if I wanna use this technique or other old filters, I can do that. So I created the normal photo, created a layer above it in Photoshop, applied this filter after testing it numerous times, and use the mask so you can see the eyes look normal. So about the only normal part are, is the eyes that you see there, the figures. And then we go from there, and this is another old software. That's why I saved the computer, it's like an etching, but it's actually a case of cherry tomatoes. And this is another situation where I use the 50 macro lens and my ring flash off to the left to illuminate that. And that's a great tool to do macros. Like I said, sometimes in the laboratory, I needed it here as shooting for the front of it. And that's what I, what I do is shoot a lot of times when I'm not shooting commercially, just for the, the joy of photography and seeing new things. This is an orchid lit with the ring flash. And you can also put the light behind and illuminate an orchid that way too. So I literally held the light source behind the orchid to make it glow like that. Here's another laboratory situation. So I had a, brought a chrome grid. That's normally what you might see in the top of an elevator or something like that. So I, I brought several of these along thinking that could be a good backdrop. And I used a bluish gel to complement the metallic feel of that. And then used another scrim grid spot on these different cultures in the Petri dishes. Oh, and this is an odd thing. I went to actually a Photoshop seminar in Miami Beach, Florida, and it was right near their art museum. This is by a Texas artist. I don't remember his name, but this is just walking from the hotel to the conference. I'd go by the sculpture and it's so incredible. And I used the flash because otherwise it would have been in shadow, but I'd never seen a sculpture quite like this, but there's a person in the background. You can get a sense of scale of how big this was. And then I don't know if you've ever, if you're familiar with this lens called a, oh, well, I'll show this one first. Here's another some fun piece by a different sculptor. So on one side, it looks like this. And if you walk around to the other side, totally different. So <laughs> I just thought that was so neat. And then this is the case where I use this, it's called a lens baby. And it's like a, uh, lens element that's in front, then an articulated accordion-like little attachment in between that and the camera body so you can bend it. And it simulates the look of a four by five camera or eight by 10 conventional old camera. And it limits your depth of field. So you can just focus on one particular area to emphasize that. This, this is actually a rather large sculpture. And so here we've got a normal picture from the front and then a picture from behind. So you can see the detail and uh, the rest of the city back there. And then a lot of times I've done, especially with film cameras and things, um, it's like painting with light where you've got a light source. It could be almost anything. And you keep the shutter open and move the camera and zoom. And um, you get these different effects. And for years, I probably sold back in the days of stock photography before there's digital stock. So it was actually more precious than more valuable. Probably seven different book covers using this technique for electronics and chemistry, just because it made it look dynamic and you could use type over that. And um, some of them were posters too. So there's just, it was like literally painting with light. And here's a, a scene from North Beach, a time exposure of cars going by. And then I did a collage of some of the elements that are there. And then this is actually the bridge that goes over Tampa Bay. It's a really large bridge. 
And I was in a car just photographing at a fast shutter speed. And these are just abstractions that I did at the bridge afterwards. But um, this is actually shooting out of the top of the car, going under the bridge. And then I created four different images and blended them together in Photoshop to make an abstract image of that. And here's a, a, a deity appearing on a condo or something like that. <laughs> So it's just playing around and here's a Maori mass and uh, double exposure of the condo looking down. And so here's a friend of mine, Ron Miller. I don't know if you know him, Patty, but he's a, uh, my, he was my doctor for quite a while. I went to high school with him. But so here's a, a photo, straight photo of Ron. So would you go to this guy for your medical care or would you trust this guy more? I mean, here, eh, that's Ron from high school. <laughs> so, but then if you light him in the right way, uh, you, you know, you see the professionalism, the intent in his eyes, the subtle nuance of the color in the background. That was just a plain white wall that I used two different gels and um, created that color. And then here, so you, hopefully you have more confidence in this guy than the guy in the first shot. But, uh, and here's the, now this at the, one point in time, this is like the second fastest computer on the planet. And this is the Cray computers at Oak Ridge where they'd upgraded it years later. This was the gentleman in charge of the whole computer operation. So you see him like an overall environmental shot and then a more detailed shot. You see the background there, the, the rows of mainframes. So I used a longer lens and had that form the background for this shot. So more of a traditional portrait, but kind of abstractly shows these computers in the background. And here's the team that ran the computers. And this is a very complex configuration of mainframes. And it's very hard to get light properly on everybody. So it took a while to set it up. And then I, once I did, I got them all in position, did a test shot, and made sure it worked right, and then photographed them. And then here's another one where it shows the extent. I mean, there's row after row of these computers. And what they did was they project, at the time, it was like one of the largest projections at the, in the country of data from a computer. And this is one of the things they were working on. They, they also would show like the fusion on the sun, how they thought it would work. And, and, I, and knowing that they had a screen there, I thought, well, I'd bring one of my shots around that I showed you previously. And they projected that on the screen. But it is a little tricky because if you were to use a conventional flash, the screen would look white. You know, you'd wash out what's there. So again, I used lights with scrimmed off. So I just illuminated the scientists there and kept the background viable. So and this is the Pacific Northwest Labs, one of the scientists there. They're working on crazy experiments. So here's the guy on the left there. And he's one of the scientists and he's just goofing around. But you can tell by his ID card, yeah, that's, that's the way he looks. So, but no, I, I just messed with that for the fun of it. So, uh, okay, and these are the last series. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with the uh, state of Michigan in the United States, but there's an upper peninsula and a lower peninsula. This is the Mackinac Bridge that connects those two. And this is on a photo assignment for a bank. So this is the day before I got a record of this bridge. And here it is, it's one of the taller bridges, longer bridges in the country. And you notice how high this, the, the bridge is. There's a case where they have a little elevator that's like a phone booth size. And something that, you know, you know, these days you may not have ever seen a phone booth, but it's very small. And I was in the, and what was happening was there's a video crew filming the, the commercial or the man painting the bridge. And while they're doing that, I had downtime. So I said, well, can I go up to the top of the bridge and photograph uh, the helicopter doing that? And so I go up in this little elevator where there's a Native American that was about 6'3", 240 pounds, and another gentleman that was wide and big. And the three of us were going in this elevator. We could barely fit in it. Get up to the, you know, totally claustrophobic. Then we get up to the top and it's complete agoraphobia. Like, oh my God, we're really up here. And then I felt my heart go up to my throat. And I thought, the only thing that helps me is having the camera between me and the scene that I was there. But here I am on the top and you can see the, the, the 
the person painting the bridge down there, and that's a special helicopter with a camera mounted on that sphere, and it kept it steady. And you can see off in the distance how the bridge went. And uh, here's a, another shot of them doing the video of the gentleman painting the bridge. And then I'm up in the helicopter here taking shots. And you can see the top part where there's railing. That's where I was taking the other shots from. But you can see the wet paint there too. And so I'm up there. This is a shot that they use for the ad about perseverance or you, know, you start something and I continue it. And the gentleman on the left there was, had this wet paint there. And he didn't have his harness hooked up to the, the guide rails. And I'm having this screen because he's quite a ways away. But you got to put that on because we can't use the shot without it. It's like unsafe. You go, oh, OK. And he clamps on. But it's hard to see in that shot. But in closer ones, it, it would be a, you definitely want to have that um, protection when you're up there. And towards the end, so this is the, the Ohio State football stadium. And this was before 9-11 when aircraft could fly closer to the stadium. But I took this shot from another helicopter, just like this one, but with the door open. So I'm hanging out the door, photographing this scene. But then I came back later on the computer and then used that same shot, but added the crowd to the, so it looked like, uh, but it's, it's not selling, a product or something selling a service. And so it was okay to add the crowd and tie in the, the university. And, and here we are, Columbus, Ohio, typical view of our hometown. And uh, so now uh, this, is, this is the last shot I have to show that for 31 years, ever since um, Photoshop came out, I've been doing a calendar of Columbus. The first year it came out, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I said, would you guys want to print this calendar that shows Columbus in a different place? So for 31 years, I've been doing that. And underneath is the, the dates and everything. So this is, um, I, oh, uh, let's see, about 12 years ago. And what it is, is a photo I took in the Andes in the background, and then a photo of Columbus, Ohio in the mid ground. And then I went to, I was in Bali, and that's a temple in the uh, Indonesia there in, in the foreground. So I blended those elements together. And then if you were to have the calendar, you could see, actually you can see MedFlight to the left hovering above the plants there. But I've got all these things hidden in there, different faces and things. So uh, there's a lot of cats and other things, but it's very hard to see from that. But so, yeah, that's the last image. So um, if you have any questions or I'm not sure I'm doing time-wise either. So let me know. Thank you so much, Larry. We decided okay. we'd let you just keep going over because we were so fascinated. Oh, okay. Great. So we were chatting in the chat box. Oh, okay. <laughs> but so, um, I think I've got everybody except you and I muted. I'm gonna unmute some people. Um, what kinds of questions do you all have? And you'll have to unmute if you wanna ask a question. I'm gonna put some water in this cup so I can get my voice back. I'll be right back. Okay, Larry. Um, one thing I want to say um, uh, that Larry has mentioned is that um, you can tell that he's extremely excited about the career that uh, he's had throughout his life. And a lot of times that makes a difference in how you create a product, how excited you are. And I know myself as a writer, uh, many times I've been sent on assignments that I don't consider really all that interesting to me, but I have to uh, somehow get in the frame of mind of the person that I'm talking to and maybe for Larry, the company that he's working for, so that you can generate that excitement within you and then get a really good product. Um, so I would like to open up to questions now. Um, Anybody in the e-learning lab want to start us off? Hi, can you hear us? Hi. 
Hi, Fatih. Hello, I can hear you. Oh, great. Someone has a question. Pauline. Yes, question. make sure we can hear them as well as we can hear you. Sure. Love Hi, Fatih. Hello. Thank you, Larry, for the presentation. Oh, you're welcome. I just wanted to find out which type of cameras do you usually use in the field? Okay. It was interesting. I started off with Minolta's. That's all I could afford at the beginning. And then I switched to Canon film cameras. And then around 2000 was the turning point to digital. So one of the early digital cameras was an Olympus. So I used that on several assignments over the years. And then I bought the first viable Canon digital. That was like an 11 megapixel. Then I upgraded to a 22 megapixel. And then the last couple of years, I've been using the 5 uh, SR, which is 50 megapixels. So, and I'll wait until Canon comes out with uh, maybe a 70 megapixel or something and get that. But yeah, the, the, it's better to have the higher megapixel count. But then again, you know, these days you can shoot with cell phones and get incredible results. So, but the, I, I would have to say that um, I've been really happy with the, the Canons and they've worked really well. I usually always carry a backup in case there's a problem. So the older generation, I carry that with me. And I had an older Rebel that I converted to infrared. So auto shoot is infrared. And I just do that for the fun of it on nature shots and things like that. So that's that's what I've been using. Um, Larry, could you stop the shared screen on your part so when you talk, yeah. we can see you larger? Oh, OK. Yeah, just do stop <laughs> shared screen. Yeah, I'm not sure where my mouse went. <laughs> Let's see. Escape. Up there to stop here. Okay. How's yep. that? Is that That's better? Good. That's great. Thank you. Sure. So, okay. Yeah. Any any other questions or I could uh, asking. Hi Larry. Hi. Um, Thanks for your presentation. I enjoyed seeing the photos, especially the ones uh, at factory settings. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering, could you be having something like a, a guide to photography in PDF form that you could email and share with us? Um, I don't know. If, um, that, that would be a possibility. I, Patty asked me to send a duplicate of this presentation. It was 125 megabytes, so I couldn't didn't have a service that would send something on that scale. Um, I don't know um, what what I one thing I do if you want to see different imagery is I'm on Facebook at just Larry Hamill, and every day for 12 years I've been putting up a different image that I've taken, whether it's that day or a painting that I've done or a drawing, and they each follow each other. So. I think I've got over 5,000 images that I've posted. So I, I show different techniques and things like that on Facebook. But um, as far as, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything set up, just these, these presentations. I'll be happy. I've got another presentation like this one I could show sometime in the future that's all completely different imagery and shows more paintings and things. So if you guys would like to see more in the future, I'd be happy to share that. Sure, we'll be glad. And um, secondly, I'm quite interested and uh, intrigued by the way you use your ring flash. And I'm wondering, would you, do you think it's, you can use a ring flash when doing macro photography? Do you recommend that? Yes, yes. Um, there, the, I'm using a Canon ring flash before that when I used Minolta's, I also used um, a ring flash too, but that was film when you don't get the feedback right away. But with the digital cameras today, yeah, the ring flash is very handy. And like, so sometimes dentists use those to take shots of teeth, but they always keep the flash right on the front of it, which is good for some things. But if you hold it, the flash off to the side, it gives you much more dynamic um, imagery. And with digital, you can see if you're getting the proper exposure and things like that. So yeah, it's a ring flash is wonderful. I think they've, I've seen on the web, there's some less expensive ring flashes out there too, so. And so when do you 
decide, so uh, what are the determining factors for when you get to use a ring flash or not? Oh, you know, if I see a little bug or an animal that I can get close enough to, the odds of freezing that with the camera on the tripod or remote because you'd be moving a tripod, but with the ring flash, you can be spontaneous. Or let's say if you see a wall and there's some really cool cracked paint and you hold the, the flash off the side, it can really bring out the cracks. And I've done a whole series of things where I, in the negative space where the cracks are, I put other imagery. So it creates like a uh, dynamic insert um, where you can make it look totally different. But yeah, it's, I'm more spontaneous. And like when I do a walk in the woods, especially this time of year in Ohio in the springtime, if I see a little flower, I just get down on my hands and knees and pull that flash out and get a shot of that. Um, I just shot a Hello Boris earlier this week. I've got some examples in another file, but I don't know how complicated that'd be to show it, but <clears throat> I'd pull a little flower off and have the sun like coming from behind and then use the flash on the, the front of the camera because I only have two hands. So, <laughs> and then have both the sunlight coming through and then the light filling in the center of the flower. Thanks, Larry. Sure. And uh, someone in the chat section is asking, do you do video as well and uh, any noteworthy differences? Um, I don't do too much video. I, I have done it for the client, the, the research firm where I borrow a friend's video camera, but, um, and I don't do the editing. So I'm primarily doing um, still photography. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes. Anyone with questions? Yes, I have a question. So first, go ahead and ask. I'm not in the e-learning though, so. Well, we can hear you perfectly. Yeah. All right, um, first, thank you, Larry. That was fascinating, mind-blowing. Oh my God. Oh, I can't get over all the pictures. Thank you so much for the presentation. Oh, thank you. However, um, aside from all the technicalities, really, because mm -hmm. there's, there's, from your from your photos, we can tell that um, you have a lot of techniques that you're using, but I believe there's a push that you have. Um, you have a push that's not technical, that's not the, that's not the camera, that's not, you know, but I believe there's something like passion or there's, is that motivation you have and what is that what what if you wake up one morning and you don't get the shot that you want what keeps you moving to go back for that shot because that's not technical but it has a lot to deal with yourself so how do you deal with days when you don't get the results you want and you have to go back and get that shot and then bring it out beautifully yeah so that's my question well, usually when I'm on location and somebody's paying me to, to be there, I've got to make sure I got the shot. So, <laughs> I, you know, I want to give them several different options too, maybe some that they hadn't even thought of, but I do get a great joy out of doing that. And I got my degree from Ohio State in, in fine arts in painting and drawing. So I look at photography as an extension of painting and drawing, both compositionally. But I'll tell you one, one reason why I'm so passionate about imagery was, um, or is, that when I was in the seventh grade in middle school, I got a book out of the library from UNESCO, from the UN, that showed how to build different things. And one of the things that it showed how to build was a carbon arc. So I don't know, in, in the United States, when they'd have a movie premiere, they used to have these big searchlights that would send a beam of light up almost a mile into the sky. And what that was was electricity going through two rods of carbon. And when they touch, they'd form an arc. It's very, very bright. So when my parents were away, I made a carbon arc in my basement. And I had what I thought was protective glasses on because there's my grandfather's I thought they're welding glasses so I'm in there with a wooden handle on a screwdriver melting the screwdriver in this giant arc and I mean, my, my base must have looked really weird to the neighbors with the lights glowing and everything but I woke up the next day and my eyes the white of my eyes were totally red and I couldn't see anything and I thought oh man I knew from the second grade I wanted to be an artist paint. So I, vision was such an important part of my life. 
So my mother freaked out naturally and took me to the eye doctor and then they bandaged me all up and gave me medication for a week. And I just thought, I'm never gonna see again. That's the thing I'm so passionate about. And they said, well, what you did was you burned your, your um, covering your, your, of your eyes. And um, that's what created the blindness. So from that day on, once my vision cleared and it was true, I could see. That made me go to the study hall and look through all these pictures. Every day I'd be looking through different painters and artists and try to think, oh, what's a cool way to share? And that's probably one reason why I presented the thing every day for 12 years or 13 years on Facebook. It's just to share a vision. And it's not monetary. It's just like, oh, I was excited about seeing this little bug today. Or a couple days ago, I was on a trail and I saw two American eagles in a nest. And that was a real treat. And I hadn't planned on seeing that. Or my cat rolled over in an odd position. <laughs> I posted that. I mean, it's just, but there's all kinds of wonders around us. So it's just a matter of looking at things and, and being excited and having the privilege of seeing things. So uh, yeah, I just, from that experience, that has guided me a lot and it makes me want to see a lot of new things. So I'm passionately trying to look at different things, go on different walks, go to different places and, and see things. So. That's probably the reason why I'm doing it. <laughs> but I have fun doing it. And I want to have, like I said, with clients, see things that they hadn't seen, you know, have them see it in a fresh way. And you can do that with your cell phones and everything. Go, gee, what if I got this reflection coming off of this? Or here's this water dripping and I get close. Or somebody's reflection is showing up in the droplet. Or, I mean, just think of exciting ways that you can view things or or put the camera like underneath it. I've done that before with plants that are here where I cannot see what I'm getting with my camera, but I'll put the fish eye under large uh, leaf plants and put the self timer on. And then I come back and see the picture. Oh, that's cool. It looks like these plants are 40 feet high and they're actually, you know, uh, 20 inches high. So there's all kinds of ways to experiment every day and just, just for the fun of it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions or? Oh yeah, Larry, one more question. Yeah. And uh, this is to Larry, the commercial photographer, not the photographer. Okay. Um, I wish to know, how do you price your photos? How do you uh, value your photos? For example, if a client steps up to you and they tell you, hey, Larry, I want a photo shoot. Uh, how do you set your prices? I'll give you a, a Ugandan, a, a, an example from a Ugandan context. Uh, most of uh, most photographers this side are determine their prices based on how long the client wants to stay in the photo studio. And uh, the average rate is usually 300,000, that's about $90, if I'm not mistaken, for an hour. Mm -hmm. and then if you want to stay longer, the money uh, keeps rising. So how about you? How do you price your photos? Well, I kind of buy the job. And also time is a consideration, too. So depending on what's involved, or if there's post-production, too, where somebody had a sign in front of one building, and they got a brand new building, and they want you to cut that out and paste that. So it all depends on the job. So and it used to be a source of income with stock photography too, but that's all changed with the uh, advent of free stock and things like that. But yeah, you generally in the back of your mind, you're thinking an hourly rate. I'm, I've been a long time member of the American Society of Media Photography, and that's a national organization of professional commercial photographers. And they, you might wanna to go to that site. It's called ASMP and they have guidelines on pricing and usage. And in the past, kind of pre-digital, you would base it on the use that somebody's gonna use the picture. So if you're taking a, a picture of, let's say, a, a bag of dog food, and it might be in a, a bowl in the foreground, if it's gonna be used in the local newspaper, its value isn't as great as if it's gonna be a national publication. So that used to be another determining factor as to how the photo that you're taking is going to be used. What's the value of that? 
Is it going to be just used personally for somebody? Is it going to be used in-house for a corporation? Or is it going to be used nationally? So in a way, you have to judge the value of what you're shooting by the usage. But I would say that those guidebooks that ASMP has and things that they have online are a really valuable asset to look as to pricing. And knowing, like you said, in, your con in the context in Uganda, there, there's probably different ranges of usage. And it, it just depends. And like I said, it used to be when I'd be going out and shooting for the fun of it, those images would have a value sometimes for a textbook. Textbooks used to be, I, I used to sell a lot of photos to different textbooks, but now since they're going more online, the value is less because they have so many sources to get the image. So like if somebody wanted a particular flower that wasn't in season for a textbook, it might be more challenging, but now with all the images on the web, but I'm, I'm sorry, it's just kind of general, but it all depends on you and the client and to negotiate it up front, see if indeed you need an assistant on the shot to do it, to bring that in too, and whether it needs to be retouched or tweaked uh, afterwards. So, but yeah, look at the ASMP, that's a great source. Thanks once again, Larry. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, great. I, I think um, I'm looking at the clock over here and realizing Larry probably has a job to go to. <laughs> you know, it's it's about 10, 15 a.m. in over here for Larry and I. So I'm going to let him go. But I, I want to express, Larry, my personal appreciation. Um, every time I hear you give a presentation, it's just so fascinating. And, um, and it's like uh, patience indicated. The, the passion that you have and the excitement is, is part of it. And if all of us can tap into that, wh whether it's video or writing or, or uh, photography, you know, that's, that's part of who we are and that makes us better in those jobs. So, so I just uh, thank you so much. Constantine and I are doing a presentation after now. Larry, you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to sign out. Okay, well, I'm probably, I do have some things to do, but I appreciate it, the privilege of talking with you all. And I just say the main thing is just to go out and take some pictures for the fun of it. Some things, shoot something that's growing in a different way or different, uh, yeah, just take pictures that you've never seen before. Those sometimes are the most exciting ones, so. Okay, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. And like I said, I'll be happy to share other pictures in the future. So, okay, well, thank you. I'll have a great weekend. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. I'll, I'll click out now. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, Jimmy or John, do we still have time for Constantine and I, or how are you doing with time over there? The e-learning lab is muted. Unmuted now. Okay. Uh, Open processors. Can you extend? Or people, how long are you willing to stay? That's it. Twenty minutes. All right. Okay. Um, consensus. Twenty people are willing to uh, stay for twenty more minutes. If that will uh, be meaningful time to discuss something of substance. Yeah, I think we can do that. So John had asked uh, Constantine and I to do uh, just a little recap of editing. What happens when you give us a story and what is our, what is our thinking when we make changes? So I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint and Constantine's going to start us out. Uh, And you should be able to see this now. So Constantine, do you want to start out? I don't think we're hearing him. Are, are you hearing Constantine over there in the e-lab? Nope. Okay. Okay, 
Yeah, Constantine, your audio is not coming in. Hello, are you hearing me? Can you yeah. hear you better now, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you to this opportunity to share, share with you uh, uh, some of the things that uh, we do when we get uh, the story. No, Constantine, we don't hear you. Hey, Constantine. Hello, hello. That's fair hello. enough. Hello, how is that? Fair enough. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, please, if, if, if I go off, please, you are allowed me. Jimmy, he's saying if he goes off video, alert him. Sure, we will. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, don't, ask, don't ask me to share with you what uh, usual I say. I, I want the AC. Don't, don't ask me to share with you what usual I go through when I get the story from, from, from you guys. And uh, um, I'll pick just one one item uh, which uh, this evening I will uh, dwell on. Uh, then uh, to, to show you what 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 I got to do when when, when I get the story from from, from you guys here. Now um there's something I've I've named that the the, the, the big principle. Um this does not exist, but maybe maybe there is a theory of man 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 that I think uh, that is uh, uh, related to something like this. But I it is uh, what Constantine has called the big principle, and uh, that is. I'm going to give the same as our discussion with the next uh, 10 minutes or uh, 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 thereabout. So, um, on, on, on the screen, you can see a brick wall. And uh, uh, those bricks are held firmly uh, uh, by a motor. The motor is, uh, is, is what, you, what you use to hold the bricks together. So, uh, each of those bricks is having a purpose. Uh, of holding the neighboring bricks together. Uh, Constantine. I hold it. I don't. Constantine, the voice doesn't. Yes, yes, the voice doesn't come out very well. It is as if uh, you are in a teen. Yes. And I don't know, but we think that it's coming from your side. Yeah, I think it's an audio on his side. What we, what we could do in the interest of time is I could scroll down to my slides and then while he's finding a, a better place for audio, uh, we could come back to his. Let me see here. Okay. Um, Constantine, I'm gonna mute yours and just go through mine and then we'll go back to yours. Uh, you know, once you uh, find a better audio place. So the one thing I want to mention to all of you is remember when you write your stories that you have to think that the person who's reading it is not going to know everything you know. So every time you write, even though it seems repetitious, you have to remind people that the Ugandan COVID restrictions went into effect in March of 2020. I do this with my dissertation students too, because we get into this frame of mind that everybody already knows that. But when you're thinking about readers, you have to think about the very basic reader who does not know. So in the United States right now, we have a, a court case going on with a black man who, was, uh, who died uh, under the hands of a white policeman. And for the very first time in the United States, the white policeman has been charged with murder. So what we have to be careful about, and this is an, a story from the New York Times as an example, is that you can say George Floyd, that's the black man who died, final moments, so everybody knows then he died. But you also have to remind people that this is the trial of Derek Chauvin, a former officer facing murder charges. And you have to remind people 
the day that that occurred. So that's just one example. Now I'm gonna look at some of yours. Uh, all right, why is it? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so fact checking. Uh, this is a story that ran this week with U Uganda Partners. Uh, be very careful before uh, when the story was written, we talked about this uh, person at UCU having the most, being the most cited scholar at UCU. Unless you have done extensive research to determine that this person has published more publications than anyone else at UCU, you cannot say that. So you can say he's among the most cited scholars, but you can't say he's the most cited scholar unless you've checked with every single person who graduated from UCU, who's currently there, and calculated all the publications they did. So be very careful. That's just one example of fact checking. And this is a story that ran this week uh, about this particular uh, faculty member at UCU. Okay, so here's another story. That story that I just showed you, this one, was written in third person. This story, which ran uh, just a couple days ago on the partner's website, is first person. And I know some of you like to write first person, and I commend you for that, because when you write first person, you're putting part of yourself out there. But at the same time, you have to remember that you can't just put your opinion as professional journalists and as ethical journalists, we have to continually check ourselves and say, are we saying anything that's libelous, uh, scandalous, uh, inaccurate? So uh, this was an email that I had with the student. Uh, first of all, when you write first person, especially, it's hard to edit yourself. So she started out with 2,608 words. We had to get that down to 1,020 words. Uh, it looks like there's a typo in that slide. That's not 1.02 words, that's 1,020 words. And we talked about uh, via email during the editing process, the tone switch, you know, moving from third person to first person. So uh, example, um, I think, yeah, okay. So if you are writing first person and you're talking about another person, sometimes you don't want to mention that person's name because it could be uh, it could be defamation. It could be an untrue statement that damages a reputation. So what we did is we took the person and we said, "This is when I met someone I will call Alex." Now, for true journalists, sometimes you say, uh, maybe I should be honest and just put the name out there. But keep in mind that, that as ethical journalists, we have to remember that we're giving our opinion and we don't want to damage someone's reputation. So the same thing happens when you're talking in first person about an experience at a location. Ancrum is a foundation that does a lot of really good things and they rent out space and they allow people to use their facilities. Does that mean that they're responsible when there's a, an experience like an evangelism experience? Are they responsible for the fact that somebody didn't have a good experience that maybe bad things happened there? So maybe not. And maybe they don't even own that part of the land where that experience occurred. So instead of, of mentioning their name, what we decided, uh, Penelope and I, is that we would mention that this experience that she had, which a really good story, by the way, uh, happened on a, uh, on a hill. It's not really a mountain, but it's called Monkey Mountain, Prayer Mountain. And we decided not to mention Ancrum because it could damage their reputation. They maybe didn't have anything to do with that. Um, all right, I'm going to go back. Uh, 
and let Constantine, uh, let's see, let me get back to, I'm gonna pull Constantine's slides up again and uh, allow him to, uh, to hopefully have a better have a better connection. Let me see if I can get that up for us. So, uh, by the way, you're all writing some amazing stories, and I appreciate it. And um, as I've mentioned to to Dalton, uh, I edit myself all the time, and I'm never totally happy with what I have. So, so please don't be offended if. I correct your stories because I'm always correcting myself as well. So Constantine, are you available now? Is this better? Jimmy, I'm still not hearing him. Are you? Come again, Patty. I'm not hearing Constantine, are you? Can't get him either. Or no, your sound is muffled. Your audio is. Hey, Constantine. Your volume is too low. Speak again, please. I think I think uh, we may not get him today. We may have to do it another time. Hey, consenting. <clears throat> We've lost him. It's a really good, it's a good presentation. I will tell you that, but I don't want to speak for him. But I, I do want to say that uh, to all of you writers, Constantine is the frontline editor and then he sends to me. And generally they're very clean. Uh, so I'm hoping that you're looking at the changes he's making and learning from that experience. Um, Jimmy, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm wondering if we want to conclude. Yeah. Okay. It's the time. But make an observation that we we missed his presentation. Okay. Because, yeah. Um, hey, Patty. Um, yeah. Well, looks like that's the only logical thing to do now, given the time we have left. But, but then, um, when are we going to um, compensate the lost opportunity to listen to Constantine's presentation? Because it seems really so important, and, and I think it is. So when do we make up for this? Uh, my schedule's very flexible. I think it's really up to you and John. Uh, and maybe Constantine too. The next time we have one of these is in May and the topic is moving from journalism to public relations, how the skill sets are different and transferable. Uh, that's the main topic for May. We could move it to May or we could do it another time. I think uh, we can find uh, uh, some time and then Constantine presents to us, even if he just presents to the e-lab uh, uh, participants from this side, I think that can be wonderful. Okay. That sounds good to me. So uh, I thank you all so very much. I think uh, having these outside professional people come in um, is very valuable. I, I always feel that you learn uh, so much from people that are actually applying what you're learning uh, in, from the textbooks. Sure. 
So do we have any last thoughts from your side, the e-learning lab? Uh, Someone with a final so question for party or something. something. And if it is uh, a message for commending the organizers and uh, mm. also lead us in a word of prayer, closing prayer. Ivan, you can take over, you can say something. Honor, <laughs> <laughs> honor. Okay, Joseph. Hey, Joseph um, sorry, I've been out of view, uh, but awesome presentation on, on writing. So much. Um, it's, it's unfortunate we didn't be able to hear Constantine. Can you hear me? Uh, can I hear Ivan very well? Oh, it's Joseph. Joseph. Joseph, sorry. Joseph, yeah. Uh, it's been a pleasure, uh, quite informative uh, about writing. It's unfortunate we haven't gotten to hear Constantine's take. Uh, I've been able to see what he does with stories. Uh, I think what we stand to learn is the brevity of, of, his, commit, uh, of his communication because what we, we managed to say in so many words, he narrows down to even fewer. Uh, so we're grateful for, for what you've shared. Um, allow me to close with a prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for today and for all you've enabled us to learn. We thank you for the privilege of meeting here even under such circumstances. Lord, I pray that as we carry on the practice of reporting, of journalism, of writing, uh, you shall give us the heart for it, the art for it, and the knowledge of God. Also, we thank you for the opportunity of Uganda partners. We ask that, Lord, only shall we earn, we shall learn, so that we are better writers, better journalists, better photojournalists for it at the end of the day. We thank you and we bless you, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you. I'll be safe. Oh, good to see you. This is